This is the Spyderco Gale Bradley 2, or GB2, which is a great knife with the wrong reputation. You see it here in two versions. The typical version, and the only version that's been available for some years, is this carbon fiber G10 laminate. These are both made in Taichung, Taiwan. So you've got your typical carbon fiber G10 laminate with a little bit of texture here and M4 blade steel. This one is pretty readily available. And then this newer version here is an exclusive that Blade HQ came out with recently with crew wear as the steel and these Jade G10 scales. Now, just quickly, main differences between these versions. Again, you've got a di very different handle material, visually quite different. And then this also is a little more textured. When you look up closely, you can see this peel ply texture. Tai Chung does a very nice light peel ply texture on their G10. Um, so there's a little more grip on this handle than this one. You can see if you look closely at this carbon fiber G10 laminate, they, which means this is G10 here, carbon fiber on top. They do put a little texture. You can sort of feel the squares here. So there is a little bit of grip on this one, but significantly less than this one. And the other thing is the blade steel here. So M4 compared to crew wear, M4 is going to be a little less tough and have a little more edge retention. Crew wear is going to be a little tougher and have a little less edge retention. M or crew wear is also going to be a little bit more stainless. Um, I'll talk at the end about which of these two versions I prefer, but they're both good and both have relatively similar properties. So they're both a good bet and they're about the same price. These knives are retail 200 bucks plus or minus $10. Made in the same place, Taichung, Taiwan. I'm gonna <coughs> take this one out of the picture and look at this one because it's probably more interesting for most people because it is the newer limited edition. So GB2, again, made in Taichung, Taiwan. This is a Spyderco collaboration with Gail Bradley. Weatherford, Texas, custom knife maker, um, has been a longtime Spyderco collaborator. Collaborator. This is obviously the Gail Bradley 2. There was a Gail Bradley 1 that had a shorter, sort of chunkier blade, thicker blade stock. And he also does a couple fixed blades for Spyderco. And Gail Bradley's reputation is for making user knives and sort of Hard use knives is what people have in their mind when they think of Gail Bradley. These are work knives. These are meant to be put to work. These are meant to be abused, not babied. That's his aesthetic. That's his idea. And that's what he tries to bring to his Spyderco knives. And you can see that in both the handle and the blade here. Let's start with the blade. So this blade is 118 thousandths thick, which is pretty thin even by Spyderco standards. Um, and certainly thin compared to what people would think for a hard use knife. But if you look here, look at this grind. <clears throat> Unlike a lot of spider coats, which are full flat grinds, you've got a saber grind that carries out most of the length here. That 118,000 stock is carried almost all the way out to the tip. You can see you've got decent thickness all the way out on that tip. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing about this blade here, you got a nice little smudge. And then you've got a hollow grind, not a flat grind. So unlike a typical spider coat, which would be flat ground all the way from the top, flat, or a full flat grind from the top, this is flat here. And you've got a bit of a, you know, light machine satin there. And then you've got this built satin hollow ground, hollow grind right here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is also a slightly rising hollow grind. You can see when we go from the pivot out to the tip, you'll see this hollow grind sort of veers away from the edge just a little bit. So since there's more space for this hollow to come down, it's actually going to get a little thinner behind the edge as it gets out to the tip. And when you combine those two things together and you look at this hollow grind, it's going to be a hard, hard for me to show it under this camera, but this gets extremely thin behind the edge. And it gets even thinner behind the edge than a lot of spider coats. What does that mean? That means with any edge profile you put on this, however you sharpen this, this is going to be a very slicey knife. And you feel that in practice. When this has a good sharpened edge on it, this blade slices extremely well. The blade shape is quite neutral and natural. you got a big flat here. you got a little bit of a belly toward the tip. The tip is a little bit above the pivot here, which makes it very natural for 
piercing into things and sort of getting into stuff, if you're thinking about cutting into a bag or something like that, it's very natural to get that tip exactly where you want it and start cutting into material while still having a lot of blade length. This is a 3.66 inch blade, while still having a lot of blade length for those longer cuts. Um, it's a pretty neutral blade shape in general, and it works well for a lot of tasks. You've got just a little bit of jimping, just a spot of jimping at the top here. It's relatively sharp, and despite being very little jimping and being the only jimping on this whole knife, it grips your thumb quite well. When I put my thumb here on that jimping, which is a very natural place to put it, my thumb does not want to move. It does lock me in. And so overall, this is a very solid blade. The thin blade stock does it a lot of favors for its cutting performance, for that thinness behind the edge. There is one challenge here though, one place that this blade doesn't do so great. And if you remember my Yojimbo review, the one thing that becomes a problem with hollow grinds, people that know culinary knives know this well, is that this transition, so if you look right at the edge of your hollow grind here, the hollow grind starts out very thin and then stays very thin. The other great thing about a hollow grind is as you sharpen this, it will stay thin behind the edge, even as this edge moves back. But at the top here, the hollow grind basically fattens up pretty quickly at the very top of the hollow as it gets toward this satin. And what that means is as you pass this through material, that material will tend to get caught right at the top of this hollow here. What that means is that this blade, when you're just cutting into stuff, let's say you're cutting into a box, cutting into tape, something like that, that edge, when it's just the edge doing the work, cuts through things beautifully. But when you start to pass this whole blade through material, despite the thinner stock, the material will tend to get caught here rather than say a full flat grind. I'll bring out my PM2 here. Rather than a full flat grind where that material gets evenly split and spread across the blade. And you can see here, by the way, how much thicker the blade stock is on the PM2, 145 thousandths versus 118 thousandths. PM2 has thicker blade stock. But this, when I'm say cutting through cardboard, feels like it passes more easily because it, this is the 15V version, it easily just splits that material and the material glides down the face of the blade evenly. So when I'm passing this through a long sheet of cardboard, I can just keep cutting and the edge sort of feels like it cuts very just as well when I start the cut and as I keep going through the cut. With a hollow grind, the second the material starts to hit the top of this hollow and get into the flat, you'll feel the drag here. And you're really, you know, the edge is still doing work, but you're, the drag that you feel as you're pushing it through cardboard, a lot of it is the cardboard trying to get past this little lip of the hollow here. And so this blade ends up being great for cuts where you use just the edge, which is a lot of the cuts you're doing. <clears throat> if I'm doing gardening, food prep, if I was using this as like an outdoors knife, <clears throat> A lot of the cuts that I'd be doing would be just using that edge or going a little bit into the hollow. <clears throat> but for those certain EDC cuts where I'm passing this whole blade, especially the blade back here through material, it feels like it has more drag than you would expect from 118,000 stock and from how wonderful this cutting edge is. <clears throat> so that's the one place that this blade struggles a little bit. And in my experience, has performed worse than I expected. I've held this, I've taken this knife out for two days where I had to break down a lot of boxes. And both days I was getting kind of frustrated with it toward the end of the day because it just didn't cut through that cardboard as easily as I wanted it to. It felt like I was fighting this blade more than I would have expected. And if I compare, say my PM2 to the GB2, for that particular task, which is a pretty common EDC task, breaking down boxes, <clears throat> this one does way better, and it's the downside of the hollow grind. This will cut a lot of you know, little things and things where you're just using the edge better. This one is keener behind the edge than this one, but this one will pass through material when you're passing the whole blade through better than this one, even though this stock is thicker. That has been <coughs> my consistent experience with the GB2 and with other Spider Spyderco hollow ground knives. So that's the good and the bad of this blade. And by the way, even though this stock is thin, they've chosen in both versions to use relatively tough tool steels. And so you don't have to worry as much. Honestly, this 118 thousandths blade stock is almost certainly sufficient for anything you're reasonably going to use a pocket knife of this size for. If you need to 
cut through a car door, get a strider. This isn't meant for that. Um, but for anything that's a reasonable use in these steels, this is thick enough, tough enough, it's going to do what you need. You don't have to worry about breaking the blade, particularly because, as we'll go into the handle, the construction is rock solid. The way this handle is constructed, you've got slab handles here. Again, in both cases, the construction is the exact same. I'm going to talk about this one. Everything applies to this one as well. You've got slab-sided handles, light chamfer all the way around the edge, but this is a flat scale that is shadow boxed with your steel liners. The steel liners, you can see it through the G10 here, are, <coughs> excuse me, lightly machined out. You really don't have much in the way of pocketing. I mean, it doesn't reduce weight much. This is a decently heavy knife. This is 4.5 ounces for 3.6 inches of blade. Um, but you can see here, the liners are proud of the scale the whole way around. That is intentional. It is intentionally proud the exact same amount the whole way and that is for two obvious reasons. One is sort of more aesthetic and sort of feel, and the other is a little bit more practical. So if you look here, let's look at the back of the knife. You've got your G10 scale, then you've got your liners here, which are lightly knocked down, but still, I mean, it's not like they're sharp, but they're not rounded. And then you've got your gap because it's open with backspacers, not a, um, or with standoffs here, not with a full backspacer. Then you've got your other scale, then you've got your G10. You've got a lot of edges for you to get grip on. So when I nestle this into my palm, or when I put my thumb here, there is naturally a lot of traction that there wouldn't be if this line, these liners weren't proud. There are lots of little edges for my thumb or for my hand to grip into. And what that means is that this knife, because of those shadow box liners, is very resistant to sort of torquing in the hand. I get a lot of grip against you know, when this knife tries to rotate, those liners grip into my thumb, they grip into my palm, and they keep it in place. As a result, this knife feels very secure in the hand relative to, you know, those, that, those torquing forces, where a lot of knives struggle. A lot of knives, when they get torquing force on them, want to rotate easily in the hand. This one doesn't, and those liners are doing a lot of the work. It also changes how this knife feels. You compare this to, I'll bring up the PM2 again, when you're gripping a PM2, these are aftermarket scales, but it's the same design as a stock PM2. You're feeling the scale. I'm feeling my carta here. I'm feeling steel when my thumb's on the blade, but most of my hand is feeling my carta because that's all that you see here. Here, you're feeling steel. You know, in your palm, in my thumb, in my fingers here, my fingers are wrapping around onto the G10, but most of my hand is feeling steel. And it makes this feel like a heavier duty, harder use tool. You know, just feeling metal feels more substantial. You combine that with the fact that it is a little bit of a heavier knife, and this feels ready to work. It's the, the balance of the knife is handle heavy, so it sits in your hand easily, and this feels like a tool that you can push. The construction, as you would expect from Taichung Taiwan, is rock solid, not the slightest hint of play. Everything fits together extremely well. Your standoffs here, match uh, seat into the scales perfectly. Your blade, this one is perfectly centered. Every GB2, by the way, I've had like six of these before. I bought and sold this knife a bunch of different times. Perfectly centered, perfectly centered when you close it up. The machining everywhere is unimpeachable. It's what you would expect from Tai Chung Taiwan. Their tolerances are razor sharp. Their edges are crisp. Everything is done as well as you could want here and it just feels extremely solid. The action feels that way as well. It's not a fast action. This is on Foster Bronze washers. It is a smooth action. This feels not quite as, you know, elegantly smooth as a Chris Reeve, but it is very smooth, very controlled. You can flick it out if you want to, but I find this works best as a slow roller. You could shake this down if you want to, but it's a slow closure, sort of naturally. It's just, it's another example of Tai Chung, Tai Chung Spider Code doing their liner locks and their frame locks really, really well and nailing that action. Continuing on the handle, this is a very neutral handle. If I compare this to the PM2, you'll see it is, there's a couple more sways across the top, whereas the Spider Co. PM2 is sort of a humpback. This one, the thumb ramp starts in the handle, and that means your thumb 
really naturally goes up onto that thumb ramp, gives you a great feeling of control on that thumb ramp. Your index finger pinches naturally on that first choil, and the rest of this handle, handle being quite neutral means that you have tons of space for those three fingers. It gently swell or sways back to the bottom. This whole back sway is basically a big palm swell, and it's just, it fits very comfortably into your hand. It is a nice neutral handle with just enough curves to show your hands where they need to be. It's not sharp on the butt, but it's curved down a little bit. It's, it's easy to grip onto, it's intuitive to grip onto. You can just pick up this knife and grab it and your hand goes exactly where it needs to be and it feels natural and secure. Now there is one problem with a neutral handle compared to, you can see here the curves are a bit more severe in your PM2 here. This does lock your hand in better with the contours of the knife. I've said this with the PM2 many times, the PM2 is sort of this wonderful design that the harder you push it, because of this choil here and this big sway here, the harder you push it, the more it feels locked into your hand to the point that you almost don't feel like you have to maintain your grip on the knife. It kind of, I've heard the term, grips you back. It just stays in your hand even as you push it very hard. And so you can focus your attention on moving the blade through the material, putting the blade where it needs to be. With a more neutral handle like this, you're gaining that ease that natural grip or you can just pick it up you don't have to think about it and your hand goes where it needs to be and you can move up and down the handle a little bit very naturally and by the way you can pinch up on this put your middle finger there it works pretty decently with a pinch grip you can't really get this starts to get a little uncomfortable when you get further up the blade but you can pinch up here for some detail work there's no choil here don't even try to use this as a finger choil that's a sharpening choil um, or there's no finger choil here there is a sharpening choil but with this neutral handle, it does mean, because there aren't those opinionated curves, that as you push this harder, you do have to actively grip the knife a little bit more. And if I go back to you know my experience using this knife, breaking down cardboard boxes, which was this one. I didn't have this one at the time. When I was doing those extended cuts, it was more fatiguing to my hand because I had to more actively grip on this knife. So when this starts to get used harder, it actually becomes less comfortable. It's not really because of these shadow box liners. You would think that these, you know, the steel sticking out could become uncomfortable. And it's not like pillow soft in your hand, but it's not like these dig into your hand. There's no sharp edges, anything like that. It's more just because a neutral handle necessarily means that you are going to have to do a little bit more work to grip this when you really want to push it hard because the knife isn't holding your hand in place with its contours quite as much as something like a PM2. All that to say, and I made this comparison in bits and pieces, if I'm picking a knife for light duty tasks, if I'm going into the garden, if I'm doing some tasks around the house, if I'm you know cutting twine, cutting open bags, and frankly, even if I'm doing you know light stuff, camping stuff, things like that, this is a fantastic knife. The edge works very well for those lighter piercing cuts. The handle works very well. It's easy in the hand, neutral in the hand, easy to manipulate. And it does all those lighter tasks better than this one because it's lighter. Well, it's not lighter, but it's thinner. It's a bit heavier, actually. But it's thinner, it's sharper, it's more neutral in the hand. But as the tasks become harder, this one gets worse. This one gets more uncomfortable. This one requires more, the GB2 requires more deliberate effort to control than the PM2 could or would. And I make this comparison because this is really most naturally placed as Tai Chung's take on the sort of PM2 workhorse knife. This is the closest thing that Tai Chung has to a PM2. And I think a lot of people <clears throat> that are looking at the GB2 are looking at it for the same sort of tasks you would use the PM2 for, which are your harder end of EDC over to outright hard use. And that's why I say this is a knife that has the wrong reputation. Because if you get this looking for and thinking it's going to be a hard use knife, in my experience, I've been disappointed with this as a hard use knife. The hollow grind, when it starts to pass through a ton of material, betrays the sharpness of the edge and gives it more drag than it should. And this handle, the harder you push it, the harder you have to grip on it, and it can lead to an uncomfortable and fatiguing experience, especially for extended cutting. And 
for those harder use tasks, I will choose the PM2 over the GB2 10 times out of 10. I significantly prefer this knife to this one and be largely because of that grind, but also a bit because of the handle. When I'm cutting through material, despite this having 25% thicker stock, this one feels like it passes through material easier, even though this one is sharper at the edge. So the GB2 ends up being a fantastic light to mid duty knife, and it could be great in a lot of circumstances where you're just using that edge or where you know, you're just taking it out, using it for a little bit and putting it back in. It's great for that, it's easy. The action is easy, comes out of the pocket easy. Um, you put your hand on it, it's right where it needs to be. Do your task, put it back. It's a great knife to just take out of your pocket and you, know, you take it out, use it, put it away. Works very well for that sort of stuff. Before a longer cutting session, I don't like it as much and I think the problem is, that's what a lot of people probably think this knife is best at. That's the reputation it has. The reputation it has is that it's a hard use knife. And I don't think it really performs all that well as a hard use knife. The GB1 may have been better. I've never had a GB1, but this is laborious as a hard use knife. <clears throat> the one other problem I'll just address, I don't think it's a problem, but a lot of people do, <clears throat> is we need to mention the lock access here. So I've got the other knife here and I'll talk about this comparison at the end. I've got an Inkosi. There's a lot of similarities between this knife and the Inkosi. So if you look at the Inkosi here, which obviously is a frame lock, you'll see there's lock bar access. This scale, has a little cutout here relative to this back one. That means I can, even when the scales are parallel, see that frame lock and push it without digging in between the scales. That makes the liner lock very easy to access. In the GB2, these scales are parallel. Now, Gail Bradley has said, uh, I forget if this was firsthand or secondhand on the Spider Co. forums, that this is because he doesn't want when the knife is torqued for you to be able to accidentally disengage that liner lock. Because theoretically, if I got my Nkosi here, if my if I'm holding this knife and it gets torqued this way, sort of away from my palm, then theoretically, if I'm gripping, I could, this finger could pull back on the liner lock and cause that knife to disengage. I have never had that happen. I have not heard of anybody who's had that happen, but it is a theoretical risk. And so instead, these scales are parallel <clears throat> and you cannot see that liner lock at all from this side. That means that you've got to stick your thumb in here to disengage this, and it is harder to do than something like an Inkosi. Is it hard? No. I've got relatively thin fingers, relatively skinny hands, but I have never had a problem getting to this. There's not a lot of jimping on there. It's not like this is a jimtastic lock bar, but it's still, it's easy enough to disengage. The lock bar tension isn't that high. You push it over, and it closes. But this is enough of a problem that some people, especially if you've got thicker thumbs, have found it prohibitively difficult to disengage to the point they've even dremeled out the scale here. I had a GB2 in the past that was modified like that. It was it was fine. It didn't make that much of a difference. This, if you've got fat fingers and you have problems accessing typical lock bars, it could be an issue for you here. But for most people, you will get used to it and you will be just fine disengaging this lock just as easy as you would any other liner lock. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult, requires a little bit more focus, but it's not that big a deal. Last comment before I go back to my comparison, which of these two, if you're looking at the two GB2s, which of these two do I like better? I actually prefer this new Blade HQ version and there are two reasons. One, I think that, um, or the edge on this, so one of the big differences between M4 and Crewwear from sort of experience, and I think this is shared with a lot of people in the knife community, crew wear is much easier to sharpen than M4. Crew wear is remarkably easy to sharpen, in fact, and takes a great edge very quickly and easily. And this came with a way better factory edge than the M4 one did. And all my M4 GB2s have come with kind of bad factory edges, especially considering how sharp this is behind the edge. The factory edges have been unimpressive. If you know how to sharpen, that's fine. Um, you put a better edge on it, but this, and I think it is part of just the properties of crew wear being a little easier to sharpen, came with a way better factory edge. And I think given the ways that you would want to use this knife, <clears throat> which is, it is really, 
not a hard use knife, as I said, but it's a knife that you want to be able to pull out and not think about what you're doing and just, you know, just do tasks with it. Having a steel that's a little tougher, a little more corrosion resistant, even if it's a little, has a little less edge retention, is probably a better balance. And these scales, the little bit of grip here that these G10 peel ply scales give, just seems to fit the knife, the purpose of the knife, much better than these uh, carbon fiber and G10 peel ply scales. Not because I don't like the look, I actually love the look of this one, but these provide way more texture than this one. <clears throat> if you've got one of these, there are plenty of aftermarket scales for the GB2 out there. Sharp dressed knives is sort of the most popular option. And some of them even remove this shadow boxing where they'll, where they'll make the scale parallel with the uh, liner. So you can get that option if you've already got one of these, but I like both the scales and the blade a little bit better on this version than this version. They're about the same price. If anything, this one is a hair cheaper. And so if you're deciding between the two, they're, they're equally good. It's a small difference, but I like this one a little better. Last comparison I wanna make, I brought it out before. This is very similar to Spider Co's take on the Chris Reeve in Cozy. You can see the blade shape, very similar when you ignore the Spyderco stuff on the top. These are both relatively flat drop points where the point is a little bit above the pivot here with a little bit of a ramp right at the end of the scale here. And they just, they both have hollow grinds. They are quite similar blade stock. The Inkosi is a little bit thicker, I think, but they're quite similar. In hand, this knife feels very similar and the handles are similarly, it's a little bit more neutral for the Chris Reeve, a little bit more opinionated down on the bottom here, but they've got an overall similar design philosophy with a relatively neutral handle, a drop point with the point a little bit above the pivot, big old hollow grind. They just feel very similar to use. Now the problem with this comparison, first off, totally different price point. This is basically a $500 knife, even in the base configuration. This is like 550 with the inlays. This is a $200 knife. They're not comparable knives in that sense. But the problem is, it, and it comes down to the grind, this one outperforms, the, the Inkosi outperforms the GB2 all day, every day. This Chris Reeve hollow grind, and I will talk about this in a separate review, because I am a big fan of the Inkosi, especially the large Inkosi. This has thick stock and comes down to a fantastically sharp edge. This thing will cut like a dream. And because of the way they've knocked down the top of that hollow grind, <clears throat> and because of the fact that Chris Reeve flattens out their hollow grinds, this one passes through material both is sharper, it cuts material better at the edge, and it passes through material better than the GB2. This one is fine. It's not so great when it's passing through that material. But this one outperforms, the Inkosi outperforms the GB2. But one of the ways I could phrase the GB2 is if you like the sort of vibe and the design philosophy of the Inkosi, and you don't want to drop $500 on a Chris Reeve, the GB2 is a pretty good analogy. And so that's sort of where I end on the GB2. It's a solid entry from Spider Cup. A lot of people love it. I like it. I like its design philosophy more in theory than I do in practice. And most importantly, it is better as a general EDC knife that happens to be a little heavy, happens to be a little chunky, but has a great blade and a great handle for EDC tasks, which isn't really the reputation it has. And so I think if you come into this looking for a hard use knife, you might be a little disappointed. But if you come into this looking for a very robust and tough knife that handles your everyday tasks well, I think you're going to find a lot to enjoy here. Hope you enjoyed this, and it wasn't a waste of your time, and I will see you again soon.